We were going for lunch and then to the National Gallery and it was quite odd because it's the first time I've been out with him on my own and he did insist walking down Shaftesbury, was it Shaftesbury? Shaftesbury Avenue, I think, on holding my hand. Which again, you know, it, it, it's quite odd. You're thinking, what if one of my friends sees me? But I thought, well, I'm, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to look nervous about this. I'm not going to back off. I'll just do it. So I walked down the street holding his hand and then he, then he stopped. You know, I don't know if it was a kind of test or something to see, you know, what me, this straight bloke, would do walking down the road with a very well-known homosexual figure. Kenneth's friends were terribly important to him. They were his family, really. And I think that uh, he really appreciated the fact that all of the people who loved him let him into their families and to become a part of their lives. But, I mean, it was a wonderful pleasure for all of us to have him around. He used to come down to the country, and, and my son was little at the time, and his friends used to come around, and, and Kenneth would then begin to entertain the kids. And I'll never forget it, because everything that he was, all the mess, all the anxiety, the stress, the, the depression, the manic thing he had, the fear, the guilt, it would all sort of melt away completely. And, and out of this came this pure, pure innocence. He is one of Britain's most popular comedy actors. I remember seeing him in all those Carry On movies. He is the most English of any of the Englishmen I've ever met so far, Mr. Kenneth Williams. By the 1980s, Kenneth had all but abandoned acting, but he carried on performing in his own inimitable style. But he aged, became very lined and, and thin and gaunt and the body became gaunt. That's sad, all that. that that's an outward sign, I think, of something shriveling up uh, within himself. It became difficult for him because he wasn't doing the work that he'd done before. He wasn't so in demand, but he was still living with the Kenneth Williams carry-on character that people were seeing on TV from 20 years before. And, you know, sometimes people could be, although not meaning to, very hurtful, you know, shouting out things like, ah, you big puffed around, are you? And, and you know, uh, for Kenneth, it may seem funny, but it wasn't funny. And I think in the end, he just used to run away and hide. Once you start, stop performing, uh, suddenly you are alone with yourself. There's no audience there, and that's when the dark moods would descend and there's no companion to share your life or your bed with or your jokes with or cleaning your teeth with. Um, and that's when the demons would race in. But the problem in, in, the, in his later life was the fact that Louis no longer became uh, the companion she was. She'd got old and he had to look after her. And uh, it was becoming a full-time job. And then he came to us and he said, she's going in a home. And uh, I said, are you sure about this? He says, well, he said, no, but I, I, I think I'll have to talk to her about it. But he never did. He never actually, you know, said, OK, um, you're going into a home. Because then I think... Ken still needed that comfort from, you know, from his mother, although she lived next door, because he would have been very much on his own. I think he was in pain, yes, I, I do believe that. Um, not all the time. I think some could be a little act of Ken's, but, uh, but you could tell, I, I think the last sort of four or five weeks of his life, uh, there was a very grey face there, and he did look pretty poorly. Obviously there was a problem there, I think he was afraid it was cancer, and he thought, you know, and the pain was very bad. And it did seem that he'd left it rather late. And I can understand anybody not feeling they can face up to going um, in and having an operation. What if life's a joke? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought? Have you ever thought, what if there's no one up there? What if it's all a joke? And I said, well, if it is, make it a good one. <laughs> I thought, I thought, well, what else can you say? That's the only practical application, isn't it? Yes. In life, if we are here, we're faced with it, get on with it. Yes. It's I mean, no good, you know, taking the, what do you call it, to poison the way out and all that stuff. It's no way out if you're on the trip or going on the outing together. You don't want people jumping off the coach half the time. You think, hello, what are they doing jumping off? Perhaps they make your journey seem rather dreary, don't they? <laughs> and I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, and I was amazed by how much he'd aged. It was still the same old Kenneth, but he almost seemed like a shell of his former self. And we went and had lunch and we chatted and he talked about the problems with Louis and how life was getting difficult and how the work wasn't coming in. But it was fine. And my last memory of Kenneth is he walked up to Oxford Street with me and I jumped on a bus to go down to Victoria Station 
And I'll never forget this. I can see Kenneth now running down the street after the bus, waving goodbye to me. And that was the last time I ever saw him. Kenneth Williams died from an overdose of barbiturates in February 1988. He was 62. The coroner recorded an open verdict. This is from Kenneth's uh, diaries. I wonder if anyone will ever know about the emptiness of my life or wonder about me and ask themselves what manner of man I was, how to ever tell them, how to ever explain, how to say I never found love, how to say it was all my fault. Who can say where it all goes wrong? The part is over now, but only drawing very much. The candles are burned, the starlight leaves the sky. It's high.